I think we're long overdue for a workstation. Let's take a look at a dual socket Xeon motherboard from Asus. All right, so this is gonna be actually a two for one video. So we're on the hardware channel right now with this video. We're gonna take a look at the Asus Z10PED8WS. This is a workstation slash server class motherboard, but it's not too difficult to build a system around it. So it's got a lot of features that you would find on a desktop motherboard, and it's not so obscenely large that it's impossible to find a case for it. This motherboard is a dual socket motherboard, meaning that it's really designed for Xeon E526XX series processors V3. So that's socket 2011-3. This is the C612 chipset also, not X99, because X99 can't do two CPUs. Basically, this is a dual socket motherboard designed for dual CPUs. This motherboard is a pretty good choice for a workstation motherboard, and we're gonna dive in and take a look at the features that are on the board. Now there's something to be said for a motherboard layout like this. This particular size of motherboard is 12 by 13 inches, so this is pretty large for an ATX motherboard. And technically speaking, it's not actually an ATX form factor. This form factor is called EEB. The EEB form factor is something that you see in, in servers a lot, and so there are cases out there that are you know, ludicrously expensive and will hold EEB motherboards. They're really server chassis and things like that. There's not really a lot out there that is designed to run cool and quiet that works with this particular motherboard. However, on the main channel, we've got a build video for you with this particular motherboard and we use the Corsair 750D. Now, I don't wanna spoil that video. This video is just about the motherboard and the features that are on this particular motherboard. But if you wanna see the build with this video, be sure to check the description because there's a link to the other video on the main channel. And these videos should come out at roughly the same time. You should also be able to head on over to the forum at techsyndicate.com and see more details about this particular motherboard and its build. So looking at the motherboard layout on this particular motherboard and knowing that this motherboard is the extra, extra large 12 by 13 inches, look at it and look how crowded it still looks. They've managed to cram two socket 2011-3 CPU sockets on this motherboard and each CPU socket is able to operate as CPU in quad channel configuration. Now this motherboard still only has a total of eight DIMM slots, but it's four DIMM slots per CPU. Now for testing purposes, I'm gonna be testing this motherboard with a Xeon E5 1650. Now 1600 series CPUs uh, don't actually support operating with more than one socket. So if you were to get two 1600 series CPUs, for example, that won't work. You would have to get two 2600 series Xeons. That's sort of Intel's naming convention. The, the first number basically tells you how many sockets on the motherboard this CPU will work with. So if you got a Xeon 1650, for example, it'll only work in single CPU configurations. Uh, there's an interface between CPUs called QuickPath, and sometimes you see it on boxes in the descriptions as QPI. And it's like, oh, how many QPI transactions per second does the uh, CPU support. And the quick path is sort of an interconnect that's very high speed between the CPUs. It's not unlike the memory bus, but it's designed for inter-CPU communication. And we can see that the motherboard real estate is basically dominated by the CPU and RAM slots in this particular case. Now you'll also notice that we've got a whole bevy of PCI Express slots, seven of them. The thing that you've got to remember is that when you're running these E5 Xeons, we're talking about 40 PCI Express lanes per CPU up to 40 PCI Express lanes per CPU. That gives you a lot of PCI Express connectivity. So if you're running this motherboard as you should with two E5 2600 series Xeons, then you're going to have a lot of PCI Express lanes at your disposal. I mean, you get up to 40 PCI Express lanes per CPU. So with this particular slot layout, you can actually run all of the slots. If you, this thing's completely fully loaded, all of the slots are gonna be running at PCI Express by eight. That is a crazy amount of PCI Express connectivity. Not only that, this motherboard also has integrated VGA. It's not like the VGA provided by the CPU because the Xeon E5 CPUs don't have onboard VGA like you know Skylake or, or Haswell. There's actually an A-Speed AST2400 VGA adapter that comes with this motherboard. Now the backplate doesn't actually have the VGA connector, but the motherboard in the box comes with a VGA breakout header. So if you were gonna say run this in some kind of server capacity where you don't need a, a, an add-in video card or you've got add-in you know coprocessor cards like the Xeon Phi uh, you can just populate this board with those cards and then use the onboard VGA adapter you don't actually even need a graphics card at the back of the board you've got the combo PS2 mouse and keyboard port two USB 2.0 ports we've got a Q code logger and USB BIOS flashback USB BIOS flashback will allow you to update the UEFI update the BIOS whatever you want to call it without actually even having a bootable system you can do that by just copying the BIOS to the flash drive, naming it a certain thing, hitting this button, and even if the system is in an off state, it will 
update the UEFI from whatever's on the flash. The Q code logger will actually copy the postcode and diagnostic information to a flash drive in case you have a system that won't boot, which can be used to further diagnose the system. So that's kind of a neat feature. Then we've got an optical SPDIF. Then at the back, we've got six USB 3.0 ports. Now, four of these are provided by the Intel chipset, two are provided by the AS Media controller. Both of the USB 3.0 headers for the front panel, those are also provided by an Asmedia USB 3.0 controller. Then we've got two Intel i210 gigabit LAN adapters, and then we've got our onboard Realtek ALC 1150 eight channel analog audio solution. The audio front panel connection is just below this, which is not really a super convenient location for the audio front panel connector. I found it was actually easier to run the front panel connector down the side of the motherboard when I was doing the build uh, than to actually try to run it from the bottom. Just because if you run the audio cable down the board, uh, it's gonna be trampled by the PCI Express expansion slots. So I just ran it over the top and had the audio cable behind the motherboard. That worked out pretty well. Now in terms of fan support, this motherboard has seven onboard chassis fan connections and two extra fan connections for the CPU. Those are all four pin and for this particular motherboard I would recommend that you use PWM fans only. The UEFI does have an option for controlling the fans but it's not nearly the level of flexibility that we've seen on sort of the consumer and the enthusiast boards but we don't really expect that from a workstation product. The motherboard also has an onboard um, IKVM, but in order to activate it, you're gonna need the ASMB8 module to do that, and that will activate the, uh, the IKVM or IPMI functionality um, for this particular motherboard. It is an add-in card, it is an option, but this motherboard supports it, so if you need you know, IPMI or remote support, this motherboard will do it. If you don't know what IPMI is, you should check out our video on IPMI because it's, uh, it's a really neat technology for remotely managing things, and so if you're gonna be using this in a workstation, configuration you probably don't need that but if you're going to be using this as a server then you probably would want to look into IPMI because IPMI lets you remotely take control of the computer you can reinstall the operating system you can operate just like you were sitting at it locally one other cool feature of this motherboard in the UEFI is that it does actually have overclocking capabilities <laughs> yeah so if you're going to run Xeon and you're going to you know it's like oh let's over voltage and crank the CPU speed and you know crank all the stuff the UEFI does actually support a lot of really cool options in terms of overclocking now most of the time people that are running Xeon don't really want to overclock, but the reality is that most Xeons have a limited, a built-in ability to overclock. Intel calls that, you know, turbo boost or, you know, turbo whatever. And what that does is if you are using a limited number of CPU cores, it'll run those CPU cores at a higher clock frequency just because the other CPU cores are shut down. The CPU has a better ability to dissipate the heat from that. And so it can run at a higher speed for a limited time. And that fits within the design parameters of the particular CPU. So what Asus has done is sort of given you some options to tweak that. You can get a longer runtime in terms of how long your CPU will run in turbo. And they've tweaked some of the other parameters. So you can still get turbo and you can still get better performance, but still kind of sort of operating within the parameters that Intel has set. It's just down to the particular options that are offered in the UEFI. So that's a lot of fun to play with. But if you're building a workstation, you really want it to be super stable. So keep that in mind. Now in terms of memory support, you really wanna be using registered error correcting memory with this motherboard. It supports a couple of different kinds of motherboards, so be sure to consult the vendor guide or the memory guide for this particular motherboard if you're going to get this and set it up. But I will tell you that I could not get it to post at all with non-error correcting memory. That kinda of makes sense because Xeon, but I just thought I would try it because some boards will actually work with a Xeon even without error correcting memory, which is interesting. And I didn't know if that was something present in this line of Xeon or something interesting going on that in terms of like what Intel is doing. But this motherboard pretty much, I couldn't get it to post with non error correcting memory and the test Xeon 1650 that I have now, because I'm using a Xeon 1650, I can only use one socket. I'm just using that for testing until my Xeon 26 XX series CPU gets here. Intel, I don't know, we can't, we can't join the Intel Retail Edge program, which is sort of a discounted buy program that Intel offers people if you work at Best Buy, but not if you make instructional videos on YouTube. So I'm not gonna pay retail for 2600 series Xeons for a workstation, but I will pay retail, I guess, for Xeon 1650, because ah, that's, that's close enough. So what we're gonna do for the build video is with the Xeon 1650, but ultimately this thing is gonna get some 2600 V3 series Xeon, so I can actually populate both slots and use both sets of RAM. If you only run one CPU, you don't get to use all the PCI Express lanes either, because half of the PCI Express slots are wired to one CPU, and the other half are wired to the other CPU. And so if you're only running one CPU, half the PCI Express slots don't work. It makes sense. Along the bottom edge of the motherboard, we've got the capacitors for the audio solution. 
our VGA header, our RS-232 serial port, our physical power and reset buttons, three fan headers, the LED uh, LED diagnostic code, and then we've got our USB options. Uh, there's one USB 2.0 port and then two USB 3 ports, and our M.2 socket 3. Next to that, we've got the TPM header and our front panel header. We've got an auxiliary power port, and then we've got two SATA Express ports and our eight SATA 3 6 gigabit per second ports. Then we've got another two chassis fan headers, and then of course our memory slots. Both the ATX 24 pin connector and both eight pin connectors for the CPUs are on the top of the board. Now you will need to make sure that the power supply that you get has a dual eight pin CPU output. So you need not one, but two 12 volt eight pin connectors that are designed for CPUs. The eight pin connector that supplies 12 volts for graphics cards is a different, uh, is a different pin out, a different connector style than the connector for the CPU. So you need to make sure that your power supply, if you're gonna build a system with this, actually has two eight pin CPU outputs because each CPU, uh, each CPU input on the motherboard supplies a different CPU socket with that CPU's power. So running two CPUs, uh, it's like two systems in one. The other nice thing with this board is that it's got a three year warranty. So overall, uh, we've already actually been running this thing for a while. So I've sort of got to play with it. The UEFI is a very, very um, vanilla UEFI, but it has a lot of features. So overall, in terms of a workstation motherboard, if you're looking for lots of raw CPU horsepower, this will do it. If you wanna be able to run 18 core Xeons, two of them, this motherboard will do it. Although you should look at the workstation class, E5 Xeons. A lot of the time Intel crams a bunch of cores in the CPU, but then they really, really throttle down the clock speed unless you really cough up a lot of money. With something like this, a really high clock speed, six or eight core, generally for most people, for most non-scientific workload, multimedia workstation type things will, will actually outperform uh, something that's like, you know, 18 cores, but only two gigahertz. You know, generally that's what we'd recommend, but if you're considering a workstation build, you really should probably head on over to the forums at techsyndicate.com. We've got a lot of people that have spent a lot of money on various different workstations, this motherboard included. There's a lot of people there that can give you really good advice in terms of, you know, what to get and what you're building in terms of building a workstation. There's a whole lot of options out there, different stuff, different motherboards. I would encourage you to join us on the forums at techsyndicate.com. I'm Wendell, I'm signing out, and I'll see you there.